So Chem 160 is the advanced organic, advanced synthetic organic chemistry lab course. And I put this course together for a couple of reasons. First of all, I love synthesizing molecules. This is fun. This is what turns a lot of people on to chemistry, to experimental chemistry, where you start to go into the lab. Organic chemistry is different than G-chem. G-chem is a lot of analyzing stuff. In the OCHEM lab, you do a lot of making stuff, a lot of synthesizing stuff. That's fun. And the big disappointment I had with the organic chemistry lab, of course, particularly at the Chem 51 level, at the big class level, was a lot of compromises get made in that class in terms of technique. And so one uses microscale stuff. You don't do stuff the way real chemists do. You don't do stuff the way your teams do in your research. And so we're going to do stuff with no compromise. And I try to spare no equipment and no expense so that we can do things the way people will do to be ready to go into the research lab and also just to appreciate the virtuosity of synthetic organic chemistry. My other big beef with sophomore organic chemistry is that for the most part, the class stops at about 1970. There are plenty of books that call themselves modern organic chemistry that have written, been written over the years. And the problem with that is they should be written with ink that fades out the word modern. And for the most part, there is so much homogeneity in the sophomore organic chemistry text that the things you learn are chemistry that largely has been developed before it's got really interesting. Some of the concepts are advanced that are interesting. These are things that fascinate your graduate TAs, like diastereoselectivity, organometallic catalysis, and asymmetric synthesis. And I thought it would be good to really give us a taste of these concepts. So this is not just going to be a class on mixing chemicals. This is also going to be a class that's going to give you a real flavor of what's going on in modern, not written in disappearing age, organic chemistry. We're going to do five experiments, and I've selected these experiments to give you a, a variety of different concepts, and also to try to expose you to most of the techniques that are going to get you to be ready for the research laboratory. For undergraduates doing research in my lab, I consider 160 a prerequisite or co-requisite for doing research, because it gets you ready to be working in an organic lab in which you are working synthesis of real compounds. In a way, this is as close as I can have to having you all as my undergraduate research students for one quarter. I can't provide everybody with a slot in my laboratory, but for one quarter through our hardworking TAs, we're going to have as close a situation as you can to be involved in the research lab. Now, of course, the big thing about research is you're delving off into the unknown. And that's one thing we're not going to be able to do here, because for the most part, I want you to be able to cover some good ground. So all of the experiments we're going to be doing have been tested. You won't be breaking any new ground in terms of frontiers of the unknown, although our very last experiment, you'll be making synthesizing compounds that are different from your neighbors. Let me tell you about the five experiments that we picked, then I'm going to go over the syllabus and mention a few points, and then we're going to uh, go on and spend a few minutes talking about the first, three, uh, the first experiment. In some detail. The first experiment is the lithium enolate aldol reaction. as a quick and dirty exposure to modern synthetic organic chemistry. We're going to generate a reactive intermediate in the form of an enolite reactive with a carbonyl <coughs> compound and isolate a product. It works really well. All of your TAs are beta testing the experiments, running through them to make sure they work well. This one was just beautiful. I mean, everything products came out, and I think people got 96% yield 
beautiful crystals, nice NMR spectra. So this is a fun one. It's also going to introduce modern techniques of handling air-sensitive organometallic creation. <coughs> The second experiment is the Evans asymmetric aldol reaction. It's an aldol reaction, like the LDA enolate aldol reaction. It's an aldol reaction that's promoted by a Lewis acid. We're going to be using a boron enolate. Anyway, we'll, you'll get to see. But the real concept we're going to introduce in this one is the idea of asymmetric synthesis and diastereoselectivity. And we're going to get some modern concepts when we discuss this of transition states and specifically faces of carbonyl compounds and faces of enolates and how we control how they come together to set stereoceptors. It's going to be really exciting, also intellectually challenging. The next one is the Sharpless asymmetric dihydroxylation reaction. Concepts of asymmetric synthesis, but in a catalytic manifold, Barry Sharpless won the Nobel Prize in part for his contributions in this reaction and for his general uh, contributions in asymmetric synthesis. One of the things we're going to see here is that if you make a really important discovery, your name ends up getting immortalized for future generations of students because these are real intellectual contributions. And chemistry is often not separated by the chem from the chemists who invent reactions. And if you go on in this area, you could be one of those chemists. Sharpless asymmetric dihydroxylation reaction uses a metal, osmium, in the reaction, and we're going to continue on this notion of use of metals in synthesis and metal catalysis in the Suzuki cross-coupling reaction, which is going to be our fourth experiment. This reaction is going to introduce us to the idea of metal catalysis in forming carbon-carbon bonds and the very rudimentary steps in organometallic reactions. Again, another modern synthetic organic concept that's really important to get exposure to. The fifth reaction is the solid phase Fuki four component coupling reaction. Reaction that's going to introduce us to the use of solid phase reagents in organic synthesis, to synthesis of compounds on a resin, and to concepts of combinatorial chemistry that are often used in drug discovery. And as I mentioned before, there are going to be many different products that are going to be generated. You will choose which product you wish to synthesize. In all of the experiments, you're going to be learning modern spectroscopic techniques to analyze the chemistry that occurs in your reaction. In this case, you'll be getting a product that, well, statistically, only one other of your classmates will be synthesizing, because there'll be 24 different possibilities. All right, well, with these, the experiments, I want to take a little bit of time to go over the syllabus and to talk about a couple of matters of notebooks and safety. Let me uh, put down the lights here. So this is the 
the web page for the, the course and I put an online laboratory manual on our website. I put assignments. As of later this week, I will be locking the website because there are copyrighted materials, not my materials, but materials from other people, from published journals, and under fair use copyright law, those can be distributed to students in the class, but I can't distribute them to the entire world through the World Wide Web. And the password is on the syllabus, the username, so you should familiarize yourself with that. All right, let me introduce you to our teaching assistants here. Tony, in fact, is running the... Running the Monday section, I've already seen he's sent his section an email with some pre-lab assignments. Tim is going to be running the Tuesday section. We may have some rearrangements in terms of who's running the section, so watch. I'll be sending an email notice, but right now Johnny is on the Wednesday section, Dave is on the Thursday section, and Nick is on the Friday section. All right, I mentioned laboratory notebooks, and I already sent you an email in regard to, to the laboratory notebooks. The laboratory notebook, the main thing I want is that you go ahead and have a laboratory notebook that is not a duplicate notebook. The duplicate notebooks are just too hard on the eyes of the TAs. You'll need to hand in real photocopies of your notebook. I'm less concerned with the specifics of the notebook. Last year, I know the bookstore had a Roaring Spring notebook that was particularly well. They have it right now? Great, let me see if this is the same as last year. This is, this is fine. A Mead composition book or the equivalent is fine. It'll be useful to put page numbers on the corners of your pages because we're going to code our sample numbers to and our experiment numbers to the pages. So just go ahead, whatever sort of notebook you use, go ahead and just write numbers one through whatever, 100 in the upper right hand corners of the pages. All right, we're going to be learning a lot of techniques. And the textbook I chose for the course, Advanced uh, Practical Organic Chemistry, really is closest to the techniques that are used by modern synthetic chemists in the laboratory. It's got great illustrations, great explanations of distillation and the like. If you were going on in chemistry, please keep this book. Try not to sell it because this is something that's really a valuable part of your personal library. But it will give you very nice and detailed instructions about handling air sensitive reagents, about doing distillations, and various other, other things that are of value. For that reason, we do have reading assignments from the textbook. I've tried to pair them with the laboratory experiments. I'm front loading our reading assignments because there's a lot to learn. So bear with me for the next couple of weeks. It will tail down a little bit. Then as things go along, your responsibilities in writing lab reports, lab write-ups is going to increase. The actual experiments, most of them are taken from the primary literature and they're in our online laboratory manual. The online laboratory manual is basically a set of chapters that I've put together, an introductory chapter and then one chapter per experiment. I'm making a few revisions from the previous years, so I'll be revising chapters four, five, and six. The main revisions that are occurring is we're going to be giving you a little bit more access to NMR data, to nuclear magnetic resonance data on your own compounds. And so I'll be asking you to be putting in a little bit more on that. You're also going to be learning how to work up NMR data. And with any luck, getting to go down to the NMR spectrometer with your TAs in order to actually run some of your own spectra. We'll also be getting on to mass spectrometry at the end of the course, and you'll be getting into the mass spec lab. So you'll be working with, oh, about $500,000 worth of 
cutting edge scientific equipment in your experiments. All right, I mentioned the reading. If you haven't done it, please make sure to be on top of of the current reading assignments. The first ones will have important information for you on how to handle air-sensitive organometallic reagents and on laboratory safety, as well as things for the experiment. You absolutely cannot come unprepared to the lab because basically after a brief talk from your TAs at the beginning of the lab, you're going to be asked to get going. Some of these experiments, we have eight hours, they won't always take eight hours, but if you're not prepared, you may find that they take even longer than eight hours. So basically, you need to be able to get going and work and learn from your TA. Don't be afraid to ask questions. All of the TAs are experienced. They've all done many, many experiments using techniques that you're using and are going to be there to help you. They are there to be teaching you as if you were their own undergraduate research students being supervised by them. There are a couple of times you're going to be coming into the laboratory on your own. Some experiments where you set them up one day and maybe it's quick and then you come back on another day and you'll need to contact the TA, or if something goes wrong, you'll need to contact the TA to ask, may I come in on this other day? So contact the TAs by email. Lab reports. So I've given us a series of assignments, and one of the changes I've made over time in the course is to increase the element of mentorship that occurs in the laboratory reports. I want everyone in this course to do well. I want everyone in this class to be able to come out with a really good experience and able to do a really good job. In order to do that, the first lab report you're going to hand in, you're going to get feedback from your TA, and then you're going to be asked to rewrite it. The second laboratory report, at the, at the request of last year's TAs, we're going to have part of it due, handed in, and then given back to you as a chance to rewrite it. And all of this is to make sure you do, do better in the course. One of, one of the things that disappointed me with a, a research student, a student who came to me to do research in my lab. I, I said, oh, I see you're, you're taking, I think it was 51C this quarter. You just took 51C. What were your favorite experiments? And the student had no idea what experiments they had done. And it's easy to go into the laboratory, mix chemicals, do what you want, write your lab report, be done and empty your head. And if you do that at the end, you'll miss out on the learning experience. A real student in a research laboratory completes the research process by communicating what he or she has learned to others through presentations. And those presentations are, in some cases, publications, written papers, and more often, their oral presentations at research group meetings, at scientific meetings. And the first stage is usually, in any of this, is usually talking about your work at a research group meeting. So the oral final exam is going to be to come and talk with me about one of your experiments at in a simulated group meeting in my office. You'll present your experiment. So I've tried to balance all aspects of the course in terms of what's important for a real practicing organic chemist. A big part of the course is, a big part of what's important is being on top of things in laboratory. 
And the person who's going to know the best is your teaching assistant. Are you prepared? Are you somebody they would like to work with? And my hope is that everybody, everybody in this class, is going to come away being the sort of person who the TA would like very much to have as his or her own student. That's what I'm seeking, and that's the impression you should make on your TA. So come prepared, know what you're doing, don't be afraid to ask questions when you don't know, and figure out, work with your TA to learn. This is a huge learning process. You're gonna be learning new techniques, new chemicals, new concepts, and new ways of interpreting data. And so work with your TA on that. Your lab reports are going to count, as well your laboratory notebook. And the laboratory notebook is incredibly important in being able to understand and reproduce what you've done. I've given a sample of a notebook, and I'll ask you to follow that, and I'll just go over it very briefly, and finally a final exam. Academic honesty, by now, I think everyone should know that plagiarism is wrong. That includes copying research results. It includes describing things from sources without properly citing those sources, whether you're citing them in direct quotations or in paraphrasal. If you need to remind yourself of the uh, UCI's academic honesty policy, we, uh, I have a link here, and you should, you should read this over. And I don't expect any problems in this course, but in the spring quarter of my 1051 course, three students actually ended up failing and getting, getting notes in their files, so this is a serious matter. UCLA recently died in a fire resulting from working with a chemical very similar to this one. The death occurred because of dangerous syringe technique and because of clothing that was exposed and caught fire and the person got third degree burns and tragically died. Everyone in this lab can work safely but it means actually learning safety procedures, learning proper syringe techniques. The biggest danger is not death or dismemberment. Well, not death. The biggest danger is to your eyes. Of all the things that can likely happen to a person in the research laboratory, a small explosion or a spatter can cost you your vision. Eye protection needs to be worn at all times. My gut feeling on eye protection is the best eye protection is eye protection that's worn 100% of the time. For the students in my research laboratory, that means I'm happy even if they're just wearing regular glasses because at least regular glasses are something between you and what's ever in front of you, and it's 100% of the time. Glasses with side shields, I think, are considered the official minimum for this course. In other words, the sort of safety glasses. Goggles are probably overkill for an eight-hour lab, although you're certainly, you certainly are, are permitted to wear them. In addition to that, some type of apron or laboratory coat is a good idea. No shorts is considered the rules, meaning so you don't spill things on your leg. No open-toed sandals. At a gut level, I worry less about those. And again, it's because if you drop something heavy on your foot and break a toe or even lose a toe, it's not tragic. If you go blind, it's tragic. Professor Sharpless lost an eye in a freak accident. It wasn't even his, quote, fault. A student sealed an NMR tube 
on a vacuum line and brought it to show him as he was going home in the hallway. The student pulled the tube from a liquid nitrogen doer in which this, the NMR tube had been. The student hadn't realized that sealing it under argon rather than vacuum is a big no-no because argon gas condenses at liquid nitrogen temperatures, and so the NMR tube filled with frozen or liquefied argon, and then when he pulled it out and showed it to Professor Sharpless, the material boiled in the glass tube, the pressure rose rapidly, and Professor Sharpless's eyes were hit by shattering glass. What's really tragic about an eye accident is if you lose one eye, you may lose the other from an immune response. Your body generates antibodies to the humor, the vitreous or aqueous humor in your eye. I'll leave it to biology or anatomy classes to figure out which is which. Your body generates antibodies when it gets exposed to this, which means your antibodies then will attack your remaining eye. And so again, eye protection is essential. Professor Sharpless has one eye. Fortunately, he doesn't have no eyes. It could have been worse. As I said, the readings for handling of butyllithium and the like have good description of safety. And as I said, it's really important because these are pyrophoric. All right, the other thing I want to talk briefly about is the laboratory notebook. I'll leave it to you to read in detail a handout on this. But basically, I've made up a mock-up of a laboratory notebook page, which I use for students in my own research lab. The only thing that's different The only thing that's different for this course versus uh, for maybe a graduate student in my laboratories, I put in a couple of extra lines. This would be a very standard synthetic laboratory notebook here. It includes a reaction of what the person is doing, a table of reagents with molecular weight, weights, millimoles, equivalents, density, sources, volume. The last couple of lines I put in, next to the last lines, phase, um, and, uh, and melting point or boiling point, because when you're starting out, you probably don't know that tetrahydrofuran is a liquid that boils at 66 degrees. And when you're doing, when you're rotomapping, when you're removing solvents, it's extremely relevant to know. I've also put in special precautions because a graduate student knows as second nature that N-butyllithium or T-butyllithium is pyrophoric catches fire in air. Somebody beginning doesn't. I put these in as special reminders. As I said, it will count toward your grade to have this format in your notebook. References are also important. What procedures you're following, what you're trying to do, a date. Your notebook is not supposed to be a work of beauty. It's supposed to be a practical document. This is my notebook or a copy from my notebook that I, that I made for this class. I use the margins in order to note things like times. Margins are supposed to get ugly. I do calculations in my margins. Margins are not supposed to be, calculations are not supposed to be done on scraps of paper. Weights off of balances go right in the margins of your notebook, other things. That way, everything's in one place. I code my sample numbers to the page number. So for example, the sample I generated here was JSN Roman 5, that meant notebook 5, 275A. That meant it was on page 275, and it was the first sample generated there. I've coded my NMR spectra to there. I've written a brief description of what I've learned from the experiment. And let's see, I've talked about how I've purified my material, and I've written some sort of conclusion. The handout has some, some additional details. Well, at this point, I would like to, <coughs> to break for questions and then talk about the LDA alcohol reaction. Uh, 
that was in my that was in my notebook. So yeah, I was saying um, in this case I was saying better. I got a better yield than when I used Kugel Roar distillation alone on pages 177 to 178 of that very notebook. Yeah, this was on page 275. So I had done this experiment several weeks earlier. And I believe my objective here was to scale up, to go from a small scale to a bigger scale. And I took what I had learned several weeks before from the purification from my crude NMR data and the like, and I said, here's how I'm now going to incorporate that to make my chemistry go better. Other questions? Is there a photocopier provided for us or not? No. <laughs> the, the library has photocopiers. You can use a scanner, it doesn't have to be a photocopier. The main thing is it's got to be something that's legible. And because you're going to be using the notebook the next week, I can't simply have you hand in your notebook with your reports. So photocopier uh, from the library work, a scanner on your computer to print out from their report. And it should only be a couple of pages. And hey, if you buy the uh, 158 bead, one buck 58 cent bead composition book, you can end up saving saving so much money that even the photocopies don't cost very much. So we'll have to do my figures, uh, drawing the blood sugar. Um, absolutely. Um, TLC, not large figures, but TLC planks I drew as I went along. Sometimes I've. When I've had access to a photocopier, I sometimes photocopy my TLC plates and just tape the photocopies. You can't really tape your TLC plates in your notebook, certainly not with uh, glass plates, which, which are better for visualization and staining. Um, apparatus, if you're just using standard apparatus, here I gave a verbal description of the apparatus. There's no need to draw the apparatus. If it's something non-standard or if it's new to you, you're welcome to do it, but it certainly isn't, isn't required. The goal of your notebook is to be a good description of what you've done so that other people can reproduce it. There's recently a, uh, a horrible retraction of a, a leading paper. Nobody likes mistakes in science, although the worst sort of mistakes are those that go uncorrected. And this person who, somebody who's hoping to win the Nobel Prize, I don't think he will, uh, retracted the paper saying, well, we couldn't find the, we couldn't reproduce it, we couldn't find the laboratory notebooks to reproduce it. That's, that's pretty lame. But suffice it to say, laboratory notebooks are the first step in making science reproducible. And without being reproducible and testable, it's not science that match it. All right, well, the first reaction, there is magic in the laboratory. And there is stuff that captures your, you at a gut level. When you do a reaction, and you transform something into something else, and you see you got it, your idea works. That's good. When you set up a crystallization and that snow of white crystals of your pure product starts coming out, that's magic. When you see an NMR spectrum and you can interpret it, and then you can look and say, ah, and I see this other little impurity here, and I have an idea about how this is coming, and I have an idea about how to remove it. That's magic as well. And when you do that purification and you see it, that's magic. I mean, this is the joy of this type of laboratory work. Oh, yeah, the other sort of joy of the laboratory work is the lab is not a sterile environment. People talk to each other. It's fun. You're not standing there for eight hours <laughs> locked in chains to your hood. You are having fun. One thing I want to do is I want to hear the lab rocking. So bring in your music players, bring in your whatever <laughs> computers, connect them up, because I want to have a little liveliness in the lab. All right, so the lithium etylene alcohol reaction. We're going to go through a bunch of very standard operations to generate a reactive intermediate, enolate, to allow it to react with a carbonyl compound to generate the aldolate product 
to quench the aldolate product, and then to isolate the material. Let me show you what I'm talking about. It's a very general and powerful reaction. You have some sort of, and I'm going to start by writing it generically, you have some sort of carbonyl compound. That carbonyl <coughs> compound can be an ester, a ketone, generally not an aldehyde. They, have, uh, they tend to self-condense an amid, but let's just say an ester, ketone, etc. We're going to treat it with LDA. I'll draw out LDA in a moment. THF is very often used as a solvent for this reaction, but not always. We are going to generate an enolate. In this case, it's a lithium enolate. You'll be generating a boron enolate in the Evans reaction. We are then going to add our enolate to another carbonyl compound, and in generic terms, we'll call it R3 and R4. So this would be a ketone or an aldehyde. The result of that reaction is we're going to get a product that still has lithium bound to it. We'll call that our aldolate product. We're then going to carry out a workup. We're going to write, write our workup as occurring with acid H3O plus. You can't go to the stock room and get a bottle of H3O plus. There's no such thing as isolated H3O plus. And in fact, in this case, we're going to be using ammonium chloride as our source of acid. If you, you could also use, say, aqueous HCl, which would be H3O plus and Cl minus, but you can never just get a bottle of a cation or a bottle of an anion. You'll notice there's a lot of shorthand here. We're writing reagents very briefly. This would be pretty typical of what you'd see in a synthetic lab. And finally, our product, we're going to be quenching our aldolite and our product going to be our aldol product. There's really a beautiful cascade that occurs in this chemistry where we move down levels of basicity as the chemistry progresses. Let me show you what I mean. In general, something that's more basic is more nucleophilic or more generally more reactive. We're going to be starting with butyl lithium as a base in this chemistry. Butyl lithium is a very, very strong base. One of the measures of basicity is the pKa of the conjugate acid. The pKa of the conjugate acid of butyl lithium is 50. We're going to be moving all the way down through a series, through a cascade, which I'll show you in a moment. I promised I'd write out the structure of LDA. LDA is lithium diisopropyl amide. It also is a very strong base, not as strong as butyl lithium. The other 
thing that's really good about LDA and what makes it a base of choice these days for so much organic chemistry is it's sterically hindered. The two isopropyl groups make it bulky, which means it's good at pulling off protons, which are very small, but it's not a very good nucleophile, which often goes hand in hand with basicity because it's blocked up, it's bulky, so it can't easily get close to, say, a carbonyl group to attack it. We generate our LDA by a reaction of N-butyllithium and diisopropylamine. Here's N-butyllithium. Here's diisopropylamine. Butane is the other product of reaction. As I was saying before, N-butyllithium is a very strong base, and the measure of the basicity of a base, this is an acid-base reaction. You could call it equilibrium but it's an equilibrium that lies so far to the right, about 10 to the 10 to the right, the equilibrium constant about 10 to the 10, that I'll just write it as a single arrow. The measure of the basicity of our butyl lithium is the pKa of the conjugate acid. The pKa of butane is about 50. The pKa of diisopropylamine is about 40, depending on what source you use. I've also seen about 36 listed. But suffice it to say that this means you have a super strong base reacting with a very weak acid to give something that's still a strong base. Very strong, but maybe not super strong, plus a very, very weak acid. As I mentioned, basicity is often a marker of reactivity, and we're going to go down the cascade of decreasing basicities. So we have an ester in this case. We're going to allow it to react with our lithium diisopropyl amide. This gives rise to our enolate. Plus diisopropyl amine. So we saw that our pKa of diisopropyl amine was 40. pKa of a hydrogen alpha to a carbonyl group and an ester is about 25. The ketone is about 20. And so now we have something that's still a weak acid reacting with something that's a very strong, strong base. And we go to generate something that's still quite basic, but not as basic as we were before plus something that's a weaker acid. Again, an equilibrium that's lying very far to the right. Now, it's worth taking a moment to think about the mechanism of this chemistry. Here's our diisopropylamine. Here's our carbonyl compound, and I'm just going to write this in shorthand here. We have a proton. We're going to pull off that proton. I think I'll write in a couple of lines here without filling in everything. We push electrons onto the oxygen, and this gives rise to our enolate. Often when you're thinking about acid-base chemistry, you'll just think about an ionic bond. You'll think about the counter ion that is sort of coming along for the ride. This gives rise to our enolate. And I 
isopropylamine. Our phenolate attacks the carbon yield compound. Phenolate acts like a nucleophile. Our carbon yield compound acts as an electrophile. So here, without all of the fanfare of our R groups, I've drawn in our carbon yield compound. Electrons flow from the nucleophile to the electrophile. We can think of this as the oxygen pushes down to give us a carbon-oxygen double bond. We push out electrons from the double bond to attack the electrophilic carbon of the carbonyl group. We push electrons onto the oxygen. This gives rise to our aldolate. Another way to think about this, you can write a resonance structure in which we have our negative charge and a lone pair on this carbon, and we have the double bond to the oxygen. This is generally considered the more, uh, the major contributing resonance structure, so usually most chemists will just write one resonance structure and show their curved arrows like this. Final step of the reaction, involves the reaction of our aldolate with ammonium chloride. Continue this cascade of PKAs. So our aldolate, once we quench our aldolate, we add ammonium chloride. Ammonium chloride is a very weak acid. PKA, or is a, I would call it a weak acid if I'm going to be self consistent. Its PKA is about 10. The aldolate is an alkoxide. We can think about alkoxides by the PKA of their conjugate acid. So we're reacting to form the alcohol. Ammonia. Lithium chloride is our byproduct. And you can think about the PK of an alcohol as about 17. So, in other words, we've run through this cascade of reactions where we've started with a very, very strong base, butyl lithium. We've generated a slightly weaker base, 
but still a very strong base LDA. We use that to generate an out to generate neolite from P something with a PK of about 25. We form an alkoxide, PK of the conjugate acid 17, and finally replenish with ammonium chloride. All right, what is the actual reaction we are doing? The actual reaction we're doing is our carbonyl compound is going to be tert-butyl acetate. Tert-butyl acetate is going to be treated with LDA, THF. You would probably see this written like this. You might even see the THF omitted. This means lithium diisopropyl amid solution in tetrahydrofuran as solvent. We're going to generate the enolate. Then we're going to add that to benzophenone. Benzophenone is just two phenyl groups. It's diphenyl ketone. And finally, our workup is going to be with aqueous ammonium chloride, NH4Cl. And the product of re our reaction, our aldol product, and I'm going to draw this, I'm actually going to draw this with the shorthand that you're going to see, see most people write this in the laboratory. So that's the way most people write a tert-butyl group. This is what a tert-butyl group is. And this is our alcohol product. And it's a really beautiful crystalline compound. So all of that will occur in one laboratory session this week. All right. I will see you next Monday, although I will probably pop through some of the labs to say hi.